Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. I am Carmen Falcone and I will talk to you today about uh, my project on these cell types, which are called interlaminar astrocytes. And today I'll focus more on the evolutionary part of this study. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about development and some future aims. And I'm studying these astrocytes in mammals. So I am a postdoc, a third year postdoc in Veronica Martinez lab at UC Davis in uh, California. And let me take a step back. So when I first started my PhD, I became um, immediately fascinated about the cerebral cortex, which I found to be one of the most complex structure of our body. And if you want to know where you can find the cerebral cortex, then you can uh, section the brain along a coronal section this way and then the cerebral cortex is the most external part of the brain with the gray matter in in the most external part and the white matter in in the most internal part so obviously this is a part of the central nervous system and it's one of the largest areas of neural integration uh, with a lot of functions and sensory and, and motor functions and it is also the place where the higher cognitive functions take place. So it has also very well organized uh, structure. It, has, uh, it is divided into six layers with um, the layers which are numbered from the most marginal part, so the, the most external part, layer one, and you will hear me name this layer several times during this talk. And then uh, they they go deep down into the cortex, uh, into the most, into the deepest layer, and um, it goes until layer six. And so layer six is the closest to the white matter. So um, the the neural stem cells, uh, so the, the stem cells of the brain, they're called Rajagya cells, and they can give rise to a huge variety of cells like um, every other system. So if you, even if you're not a neuroscientist, you're for sure you have heard about neurons. And, um, but if you are not a neuroscientist, perhaps you haven't heard about other cell types of the central nervous system, which are the glia cells. And, since I started my research career, I was focused um, on astrocytes, and I kept this focus for my, my postdoc as well. So what are astrocytes? Uh, the astrocytes are these um, star-shaped cells, and that's why they are called astrocytes. So they are also considered the most abundant type of glia cells in the central nervous system, and they send these radiating projections to neurons and blood vessels, so they contact both structures. And they have uh, been thought for many, many years in literature to, to have just a structural roles uh, for other cells. But now we know that they do have other many other roles. So they can provide, for instance, metabolic support or they can um, participate in the formation of the blood brain barrier and also regulate ion concentration and many other roles that I won't go into details of. But what I would like to stress from the very beginning is that there is a huge cellular heterogeneity like uh, many other cell types. So there are different types of astrocytes. And if you are a neuroscientist, you've probably mostly heard about the two major types of astrocytes, which are the protoplasmic and the fibrous astrocytes. So the protoplasmic ones, you can distinguish these two types of astrocytes because of the morphology or the cellular molecular markers. And also because the protoplasmic are mostly present in the gray matter, while the fibrous astrocytes are mostly present in layer five, six and in the white matter. And What's important for my topic is that uh, these astrocytes are present in all mammals. While, and, and these were the astrocytes that I studied mostly during my PhD. So when I studied my postdoc, I found out that there are actually other astrocytes which are present and, and, and are restricted uh, to some specific groups of, of mammals. And for instance, there are the interlaminar astrocytes, that are the astrocytes that, that I'm studying right now, and this is, uh, these are the astrocytes that I'm going to talk to you today. And then and they were thought to be specific to primates, while there are even other astrocytes that are even thought to be observed uh, only in humans. So that is just an example to show you that they can reach such a level of specialization that they can be even specific to just one species. 
So why are these interlaminar astrocytes so special to me? Well, um, first of all, they have a very peculiar morphology. So if you look, all the other, these are very old drawings and they were already observed in way long time ago. So if you look at the other classical astrocytes in the cerebral cortex, um, they have a, a round shaped anatomical domain of the cellular uh, branches or processes around uh, the cell body. So the, the processes of the other classical astrocytes, they usually do not go beyond the, the, the boundaries of different layers of the cortex. So they stay confined within one layer. While these astrocytes, they are called like this because they have the cell body in layer one, very, very close to the most marginal part of the cortex. And they send deep down into the cortex this um, very long interlaminar processes. And they're called interlaminar because lamina also is a synonym of layer. So they can cross different layers. And then if they cross layer one, then they are interlaminar astrocytes. So nobody knows the, the, the function of these long processes. And nobody knows why they are so different uh, in terms of anatomy and, and morphology from, uh, from the other astrocytes. And they have been hypothesized to be involved in the regulation of the columnar organization of the cerebral cortex because, you know, the cerebral cortex is also organized in, in columns and these columns are more um, visible in, in the primates. So, so that's why they were thought to be present all in primates. And they have been studied extensively in primates, especially by this group, by Colombo. In Argentina, he had done um, most of the study on on these um, astrocytes twenty years ago, and then apparently no nobody else really studied them and, uh, until now. So I became really interested in how these astrocytes, uh, what would they do, and and uh, how they can be evolved. So how can uh, we recognize these astrocytes? Um, the interlaminar astrocytes, we don't know any specific marker at the moment, so we can just do an immunofluorescent staining uh, against GFAP. And for those who know, GFAP is a very well-known marker, it's also for other astrocytes. So because we cannot recognize them just with a marker, we cannot recognize them from the other astrocytes. So basically we need to look at real sections from real brains and then uh, distinguish them by um, morphology and a position in, in the cerebral cortex. So here you see a uh, staining on a macaque and the cell body very close to the PS surface and they send down, dip down these uh, cellular processes which can reach up to layer three or uh, four. So these were the main questions that we got uh, when we first started this project. First of all, uh, we really wanted to know when did they appear during evolution. So uh, is it true that only primates had it or uh, what would happen in other mammals? Do they have something in layer one or not? And then uh, we wanted to study when are they born, how they develop, what's the difference between their development and the other astrocytes development. And finally, of course, what do they do? We, we don't know the function yet. So today I'll tell you more about evolution and I'll tell you something that we're doing about development and, and, and the function, but this is just for um, the very few last slides. I'll focus on evolution. So <clears throat> very first question, very simple. I didn't even have to keep it simple for all this broad audience. Uh, it was that simple. Are these interlaminar astrocytes really specific to primates or not? And in order to figure out this question, we uh, had to collect as many species, as many brains from as many species as we could uh, from mammals. And so we were lucky enough to have amazing collaborators that could ship us pieces of brains or sections from the weirdest animals, some animals that I didn't even know, even, didn't even know the ex existence of. So um, we were able to encompass most of the mammalian orders. So we got uh, several primates of many subgroups of primates. We got some rodents and arctodactyls, which are hippopotamus, whale, uh, dolphin, sheep, uh, carnivores like cats, tiger, or uh, many bats, uh, elephant, and uh, even some of the older um, uh, mammals like marsupials. So 
we did a very simple thing. We did a staining uh, on this uh, brain sections, um, anti-GFAP, and we went to look in layer one to see if we could find something that could resemble this interlaminar astrocytes, even in the non-primate species. Um, so this is where we got one of the most surprising results of the beginning of this project, because we find, we found out that all the mammals have a certain type of interlaminar astrocytes. So if you look in layer one, some uh, may have what we call the rudimentary interlaminar astrocytes with a cell body very similar uh, um, to the typical interlaminar astrocytes in, in terms of position in the cerebral cortex and look very, very close to the PIA membrane but with the cellular processes very, very short and not able to cross layer one, that's why we call them rudimentary interlaminar astrocytes. Well, other species, other order of mammals, they have what we call the typical interlaminar astrocytes, so we, with some processes that were able to cross layer one. But even those, they were not specific to, to primates. So, so for instance, here you're looking at one interlaminar astrocyte from this weird guy here, which is a rock hyrex. So the question became, what is really specific to primates then? Why do they have been studied so much in, in primates um, if they're, they're also present in other species? Do they have something special in primates or not? Uh, and in order to answer that question, we decided to measure their density and morphology across evolution. So we use the same, very same species that we used for the first part. And I remind you, this is... So a piece of the cortex, and these are uh, these interlaminar astrocytes, how they look like, and they basically in layer one they line up uh, below the PIA surface. So on the sections we could count uh, the number of of these uh, cell body lined up uh, on the PIA membrane uh, divided by the the PIA perimeter. So we call it linear density. This is not a true density, um, and we measured this in all the species that we had and we found that the primates had the highest interlaminar astrocytes density if compared to the other uh, orders as you can see here um, but what we found even more interesting was to uh, measure it and, and reconstruct the morphology so we use a software called Neurolucid I won't go into details of that you can ask me questions about it and how it works so we were able to reconstruct 3D morphology of single cells of, of these astrocytes in, in all the species and I hope you can appreciate here so these are some example of reconstruction one for each order and you can see that the primates had the highest um, um, morphological complexity if compared to the other orders so even the the arctodactyls which have pretty long um, processes they cannot reach this level of complexity of, of the primates and why are they morphologically special? Well, um, they have uh, the processes, they are more branched, so they have more processes. And the total length is highest, uh, higher compared to the, the other orders, and also the complexity, and, and the complexity is an index that the software gives you. Uh, and then we also wanted to know if there were some differences b b within primates. So, so we had many different um, primate species and we found that the ancient primates, the Presumians and the Tarsi, they were simplest. Well, uh, if we were coming closer to, to human, like the great apes had the highest complexity in terms of uh, morphology. Uh, so to conclude, um, all the mammals that we studied, even marsupials, show at least a rudimentary form of interlaminar astrocytes, and even the typical interlaminar astrocytes are not specific to primates. So they seem to be a pretty old population in, uh, along the mammalian evolution. And what makes them special in uh, the primates are the density and the morphological complexity. So just a few more minutes about um, what I'm studying right now. So now we are comparing their development of um, the typical interlaminar astrocytes. So we got three different primate species and we got uh, different brain sections of so prenatal and postnatal uh, developmental stages. And we also want to compare their development of um, in uh, typical interlaminar astrocytes with rudimentary ones to see if we could use a mouse as an animal model. I suspect not, but uh, because they're very different. 
so we have to stick with primate um, and finally the functions uh, other than clonal organization uh, I suspect it can also help to the other neurons to integrate information from different layers because this is what basically makes them really different uh, from the other astrocytes or they can have a role in pathology and this is what we're studying right now we are studying different brain areas in a human brain brain area specialization we are studying uh, what are the other cells that they um, connect to and finally, we're gonna do a sequencing to see if they express different genes compared to the other astrocytes, and we're gonna study them in um, other pathology. So these conclusions are the conclusions that I already told you. They have a very ancient origin. They're special in primates because they have the highest uh, density and the morphological complexity compared to the other orders, and their function is still not known, but we're working on that. And I would like to thank my uh, mentor, Veronica martinez uh my wonderful lab mates that you can see here, and of course our collaborators, and you for the attention for this first BioRoom seminar.